What's up everyone, Jessica Dean here, and today we're gonna talk about a handful of network tips and tricks that you can do right now to take control and enhance your existing home network. Let's check it out. All right, so one of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do is take a look at your modem, right? Now this, is a modem, but it's also a router and an access point, okay? It does a lot of things in one. This would be something equivalent to what you're provided by your cable company, okay? But the back is gonna be the same. You're gonna have a little coax port right here, okay? And you're gonna have a coax line that goes over to this and then to the wall. Your coax line is gonna look like this, okay? It's, it's not quite as malleable as a phone line or an ethernet line, but as a little circular jack with a needle sticking out of it in the middle. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're using a good quality cable. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you take a look at the cable itself, you're gonna look for some white writing and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it says that it's shielded, okay? You want to make sure that you're using a shielded cable. This way, in, when you have other devices, other wireless devices, phones, computers, you wanna make sure that this is shielded as much as possible from interference. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to take a look at is that little metal pin itself. You wanna make sure that it's not bent, that it's not obstructed, that there isn't any silicone or plastic or anything covering that connection that ultimately goes over to here. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to check is the modem itself and the health and status of the modem. Now, first off, if you're using a modem that is given to you by your cable provider, get rid of it. You you shouldn't be using it. It is my professional and personal opinion to segregate out your equipment, okay? This does a lot of things. This is a modem, this is a router, this is an access point. Go ahead and delegate that responsibility. Chances are, depending on who your internet service provider is, you might even be paying monthly to rent this equipment. It is so much more affordable and economically smart to own your own equipment. You can get just a simple modem that looks like this. It still has that coax port, and then it just has one ethernet port. This would then connect over to a router, and then that router would probably have an access point or wireless access point built in. Take, for example, this Orbi router and access point all in one. Now I've started to delegate out that functionality. Now, once you own your own router or modem, all of that own equipment, you'll be able to have more control over into the insight of your network. For example, my modem is a Netgear modem. I own a Doxus 3.1 modem because in the area I live in, in California, Comcast allows me to have access to a gigabit plan. Now, it's not true gigabit. I only get gigabit speeds down. I get about 40 up. But in order to support that plan, I needed a special modem, something that was higher than the standard DOCSIS 3.0 modems, okay? So you're gonna wanna make sure that you read anything on the bottom of your modem devices. You can see this right here, it says DOCSIS 3.0, this is older. This is also wireless N, this is very old. But read and know what kind of equipment you're using. Next, you're gonna have to do some homework. If you have a Motorola, if you have a Netgear, if you have an Aris, which is Motorola, you're gonna to wanna to find out what that address is to sign into it locally. In my case, for a Netgear, my address is 192.168.1.1. So, for example, let's go ahead and just boost up the screen here. All right, there we go. If I go ahead and log in here, which is admin and password, again, for my Netgear, you're gonna to wanna to look up for whatever modem you have. You can see that my cable connection is good. Well, great, I should probably trust it. No, let's take a look at the cable connection information and actually investigate a little bit further. This is where we're gonna be able to tell things like our signal strength or our power that's coming over that coax line into the modem. So you can see a bunch of different numbers already right off the bat. I'm gonna start scrolling down here and you'll notice things that say frequency and power and SNR, MER. Now, the amount of channels you have, whether you have 32 or eight or 16, however much, that's gonna be contingent based on the type of modem that you have. For a DOCSIS 3.1, there's 32 channels. And in my case, I have 31 of them that are locked. You can see right down here. 
Each one of those channels corresponds to a frequency. But the most important thing to check is the power levels here, the SNR, and then these correctable code words and uncorrectable code word columns. So for example, you want usually, this is a best practice for power, somewhere between negative seven and positive seven dB. If you're seeing things in this column that are higher than negative seven, meaning negative eight, negative nine, negative 10, I guess that would be lower. But if you're seeing that, you're gonna wanna possibly contact your cable company to see why that is. Before you contact them, I'll give you one tip that can help you check that. But that's gonna be one indicator of what could be causing some issues with the reliability of your connection to your cable modem. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to check is this SNR. This is your signal to noise ratio. You wanna make sure that it's ideally higher than 38. My professional opinion is you want it somewhere between 40 and 44. You don't want it higher than 46, 47, somewhere around there, okay? Ideally, again, 40 to 44 is where you want it. If you're seeing some of these numbers in the 30s and the low 30s, you don't want it lower than 36, but that's gonna be another indicator that there's a problem with the signal strength that's going into this, okay? Power and signal strength is important. Another key indicator on this page is the amount of correctable code words and uncorrectable code words. Some correctable and uncorrectable code words, all of that, some of them are okay. You can see I even have down here, I have 1300, but what you don't wanna see is millions of these, okay? You don't wanna see large numbers in these columns because that's also gonna be an indicator that you're having issues on the frequencies that are going to the channels that's ultimately delivering the speeds that you're paying for, okay? Once you've checked that from your modem, once you've checked the cable, you've checked the health of the modem, I mentioned how you can check that power, right? This, the power signal or the power strength, pardon me. First, that cable that is connected from here over to the wall, there's another cable on the other side of that wall outlet that's ultimately going up, okay? And I say outlet, but it's a coax, right, connection. There's another coax cable that's in that wall, and it's often gonna go over to some other part of your house. It might go to a basement, it might go to an attic, it might go to a utility closet, or who knows, especially if you live in an apartment. But you're gonna wanna find out where that cable goes and see what that cable is connected to. Chances are it's gonna be connected to something that looks like this. This is what's called a splitter. And these were really, really common, they still are, but this directly affects the power that runs over that coax line and ultimately to your modem. If you read really closely here, you're gonna see right above each of these things, it says negative three and a half dB. That's each time you connect that coax line, you're actually taking away three and a half dB worth of power, which is why when you looked at that power column, if you happen to see negative nine, negative 10, negative 11, your ISP should talk to you because that's out of scope. But when you have, happen to see that, take a look and see if you have any of these splitters. I've looked in customer houses. I just moved into a new house. You can tell my office is different. And I opened my own cabinet in my own house. And I kid you not, I had five splitters on the line. You don't need the line separated that much. In fact, if you can get away with it, Whatever that line is split off and connecting to, if you only need the one running over to the office or the bedroom or whatever's connecting to this device, if you only need that line and you don't need other connections, just use a coupler, okay? This is what a coupler looks like. You're just gonna have one end go in here and the other end go in here, and now you don't have to worry about splicing it off or degrading your power, okay? The next thing you're gonna wanna check is the wireless signals. So in this case, because you're using an all-in-one system, you are responsible for the modem, the router, the wireless signals, technically the ISP is, but you're responsible of letting them know that it's not working well or it's not getting to the back of the house. It's not having fast enough speeds for your Teams calls, for your Zoom meetings, which is why when you own your own modem, something like this, and then you connect it to something like this, like a router, you can now start to take control of your wireless, of your routing, of your speeds that you're getting. When you use something like this, an Orbi or a Netgear or a mesh network of some sort, Google makes one as well, Eero makes one, 
oftentimes you'll have multiple devices. One connects to the modem, okay? And that's the one that operates as the router. And then the rest of the satellites or the rest of the little access, cute little things, those are connected to that router wirelessly. Now, that's the way that they tell you to set it up. Only in my recommendation, there's a better way if you can find it. Now, when you connect that, you're going over wireless. That's called a wireless backhaul. If you can manage to run an ethernet cord from the back of this, from one of these three ports, if you can manage to run it over to your other satellites, even if you run one to one satellite and then another cord from that satellite over to the third satellite or however many you have, you've now created what is called an ethernet backhaul. It is no secret that you are going to get faster speeds when you are directly connected to your router, to your access point over ethernet. You're gonna get much faster speeds than wireless. But even if you're connected to your satellite over ethernet, if that satellite is connected to the router over wireless, you're still at the mercy of whatever the wireless speeds are. So if you can, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you can use an ethernet backhaul. All right, so let's do a quick recap here. First and perhaps the most important is make sure that you own the equipment in your network. When you own it, you're able to modularly upgrade it as the needs of your network change. Two, make sure that you're using a high quality coax cable, something that's shielded, something that doesn't have a bent pin, that doesn't have any silicone in the center there, right? Make sure that there's no obstructions on the line, that you're not using splitters, okay? Remember the health of your cables. Log into your modem, right? That's number three. Log into your modem and see the health of your device. See if you have any signal noise on the line, right? You wanna be between 38 and 45, 46, I recommend between 40 and 44. Make sure that your power signals are between negative seven and positive seven. If you're at the tail end of the spectrum of negative seven and you have a splitter on the line, removing that splitter alone will bump you up three and a half points right there, okay? On your wireless system, when you're using a wireless net mesh network, and if you're not, and if you wanna get faster speeds and more Wi-Fi coverage and no dead zones, you should probably get a Wi-Fi mesh system, but when you use something like Orbi or Eero or Asus or Netgear, Blackhawk, whatever it is, when you have multiple devices around the house, see if you can create an ethernet backhaul. That's gonna give you a more reliable signal even for the other satellites. If you have to run a really long ethernet cable and you don't mind ugly cables, do it. Maybe you can hide it under a carpet or a baseboard or you can run it under a crawl space or maybe you can use something like this. This is an AC power line adapter. It just plugs into an outlet. There's a little ethernet port at the bottom here. I would plug it in next to where my modem and my router is, and then I take a second one, it's, it's little brother, it's cousin, or whatever pronoun you wanna use, and I plug it into the other end of the house, okay? It also has an ethernet port. And then I just connect the satellite over to this. Now, if I don't want to give up two different outlets at two different ends of the house, I could also use something that's called Mocha, or multimedia over coax. Unfortunately, I don't have any of those devices to show you, but you can check it out on Amazon. I'll include links in the description. And essentially what that does is it sends the ethernet signal over existing coax lines. So if you know where one coax line at the end of the house, if it happens to run into the office or run into somewhere that's accessible to be able to plug in a cable to the back of this, use that coax line as an ethernet line through those Mocha adapters. They make adapters that now can support two and a half gigabits worth of speed over that. So you can take advantage of existing cables you may not already be using. Okay, and finally, if you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, make the YouTube overlords happy, and I will see you next time. Cheers, y'all.